Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jennifer Bentley and the ISU Dairy Goat Extension team for asking me to join you for this conversation uh, this afternoon on caprine arthritis encephalitis. And I apologize for not being able to be live. I um, got double booked into this session and uh, apologize for that difference, but hopefully we'll have plenty of opportunity to provide you some information. And, and then um, I've on this uh, first slide provide you my email address and I'm more than happy to follow up by email if you have questions. And again, appreciate your understanding in that process. Um, for those that may not know me, my name is Paul Plummer. I'm a veterinarian, a professor here at uh, Iowa State University at the College of Veterinary Medicine uh, with a uh, focus on large animal internal medicine and infectious disease and uh, teach in our clinical program here. I also am a dairy goat breeder. I grew up with dairy goats uh, back on the East Coast and so have bred Toggenbergs for my entire life and continue to milk uh, to this day. So uh, even this morning was out milking uh, with my kids in the barn this morning and be out there this afternoon. So dairy goats are an area that I spend a lot of time on and um, really enjoy and uh, uh, lead a lot of our efforts with others here at Iowa State and training our veterinary students, our upcoming veterinary students to understand small ruminant medicine and more specifically uh, dairy goat medicine in particular. So I'm excited to be visiting with you today on this topic of CAE and um, hopefully provide at least my perspectives on um, some important components to this disease process and um, and, and then help think about how these can be applied and some of the complexity. Um, and, and so certainly CAE is a disease process that as dairy goat breeders, we spend quite a considerable amount of time thinking about, particularly in the registered um, dairy goat industry. In the commercial industry, uh, certainly an, a challenge for a lot of our commercial herds that, um, that because of their size and, and the ability to source animals aren't always able to start or even maintain CAE negative status. And so it's an important disease process. And I hope in these next uh, few minutes to visit with you uh, and give some foundational ideas about what CAE is and why it's important. Talk about testing strategies and, and then talk about its impacts kind of on the herd level and, and more broadly in our commercial systems. So with that, um, we'll dive straight into it. So uh, in terms of its recognition as a virus, caprine arthritis encephalitis virus, or CAE, falls into the family of retroviruses and more specifically, lentiviruses. So this is the same family of viral organisms that uh, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, um, would be in, uh, as well as some other lentiviruses. So these are um, viral genomes that integrate into the uh, genome of the host. And so from a disease perspective, that's important because once an animal is infected, they're infected for life. This is not a, a virus perhaps like COVID where we can become infected and then move to a negative status uh, with these retroviruses because of the way they integrate into the cellular nature of the goats. Um, once they're infected, they're infected for life. And so that's important when we consider and talk about here in a little bit our testing strategies, because um, again, if, if we get a positive that tells us that um, for sure they're infected and, and we don't have this kind of potential, certainly there are some complications with testing, but we don't have this potential, well, is this old virus or, or a previous infection that's giving us a false negative or false positive uh, in reality, uh, if they've ever been positive, they're going to remain positive for the rest of their lives. In terms of transmission, um, you know, this is an area that uh, a number of folks have worked on over the last couple of decades. And our uh, understanding is that this is primarily a vertically transmitted disease that's passed from the dam to the kids. So infected dams have the potential to pass this to kids particularly through the consumption of colostrum. Now, in reality, any sort of movement of lymphocytes um, that are a commonly infected cell, so these are uh, white blood cells from the blood, 
any sort of movement of those lymphocytes carrying the virus potentially can transmit it. So we do see some degree of horizontal transmission that can occur through transmission of secretions that contain um, those mononuclear or those white blood cells. So, uh, you know, when we talk about HIV patients, um, transmission, you know, kind of um, casual conduct, contact um, or interaction, being in the same room as a person is, is probably pretty limited in its risk. Um, however, if there's um, blood what, that would have those white blood cells, any sort of transmission of blood or saliva that contains those white cells, milk, um, colostrum that may have those white blood cells uh, and or um, semen uh, potentially, uh, there is a potential transmission. So our highest risk is associated with um, the uh, movement of these white blood cells that um, can um, occur as uh, we share needles or as uh, a kid in this case, uh, most common mechanism would be a kid consuming that colostrum that has those white blood cells in the colostrum naturally. And so those uh, white blood cells in the colostrum in these kids, particularly um, these newborn kids that have a gut that's allowing um, the absorption of the antibodies that are critically important in, in that colostrum for transmission of immunity to those kids, that same leaky gut actually allows for the absorption of entire lymphocytes. And so as those lymphocytes uh, are absorbed, then the virus is carried with them and, and then there's the potential for um, transmission as, that, as well there. Certainly we can have what would be kind of considered naked virus or, or virus that's been repackaged after it's um, broke out of the, out of the lymphocytes. And, and so we sometimes use that for induction studies, and, and certainly that's a, a potential mechanism of transmission. But when we have the movement of those lymphocytes, that uh, definitely increases our risk. And so with this primary vertical transmission, when we think about this from a commercial standpoint or from a veterinary standpoint, this helps us to identify our key area for um, for hazard control or has a critical um, control point in uh, trying to clean up herds is this transmission from dam the kids. Um, and then as we start to mitigate that, then this horizontal transmission role uh, certainly can play a, uh, an important part as well. And, and in many cases, we um, have to address that on top of the vertical transmission if we wanna completely clean up a herd. So when we think about what the classic signs are, this is, this is an area where growing up in the industry, um, you know, this has changed pretty significantly, in, in, at least in my view, over the, over the last several decades. Um, our classically, when we read the textbooks or when we talk about this disease process, classically, the clinical signs in adult animals were these very large swollen knees with degenerative joint changes. Um, you know, they might have had a lymphocytic infiltrate into their udders, causing a symmetrical firm swelling of the, of the mammary gland or kind of hard bag, if you will. Um, in some cases, they may be uh, more challenged to maintain weight and, uh, and have decreased production ability. But certainly when I was a kid, you and a few pictures here, a few minutes, I'll, I'll show you a picture of a uh, you know, what I consider a classic CAE animal. Um, that was what we saw when, when I was growing up in the industry. The fact of the matter is that because many of these animals were very easy to recognize, and, and when you saw these great, great big knees on, on uh, these dairy goats, it was pretty obvious that those animals had CAE, and they were very easily then culled in, in many cases, and often even without testing, because you really didn't have to test to be able to look at their um, joints and say, wow, that's a really arthritic animal. I bet it's CAE. And so what that's led to is over time, now I would say that the majority of the animals that we see in our commercial and even in our uh, um, genetic or purebred um, operations, it's very hard to see these changes grossly in, um, in younger animals, even though they may be positive. And so um, through kind of selective pressure of our ability to identify these very severe animals, 
uh, even without diagnostic testing and, and the cooling pressures that we've applied there, I think we've selected for some viral strains that are much more insidious in their onset. And, um, you know, I think they still cause production losses. I think they still, um, you know, certainly can infiltrate the mammary gland and there's no doubt, but which they can still cause some de degenerative change. But we've um, in some ways selected for, I think in many cases, viral strains that are less severe in their manifestation to where, um, you know, the days of being able to sit kind of uh, at, at the side or outside of a pen and look through and identify uh, a number of animals that had clinical signs consistent with CAE in many of our herds, those are gone and, and you look in the pen and they look pretty homogeneous, but if you were to test them, there'd be significant CAE present. And so um, we have through um, you know, both evolution of the virus itself, which, which is a rapidly evolving virus, but also through our selected pressure that we've applied because of culling and, and clinical signs that were quite obvious, uh, we've selected for uh, a, a less severe manifestation. So certainly as veterinarians or as producers, I would caution you against the, um, the possibility or the concept of, um, you know, being or expecting that this animal, even though it's positive for CAE on an ELISA test, um, doesn't look like a CAE animal. And the fact of the matter is many of these CAE animals have minimal to no overt clinical signs that we would see in the absence of testing. Um, the similar situation is true on, on kids. And so when I work with veterinary students, you know, I think um, in, in fourth year, we're, we're asking them for differential list. And anytime you have a neurologic goat kid, uh, you know, it's like, oh, it's got encephalitis needs to be on there for CAE. And in my experience, personal experience, CAE as a driver of encephalitis is, is very rare. Um, and I'm always, uh, you know, kind of reemphasizing to the students that uh, neurologic kids, we, we need to have, you know, hypoglycemia um, and, and some of those types of processes uh, probably higher on our list as causes of uh, neurologic disease in, in the majority of these kids as opposed to encephalitis. So that's not to say that it doesn't occur and, and that it shouldn't be potentially on our diagnostic list, um, but it is rare in my experience and in many cases, other causes of neurologic disease or encephalitis are, are much higher um, in their likelihood. So don't get dissuaded by it being in the name to think that that's a, an extremely common manifestation of this uh, virus. So I'm often asked, does CAE have you know, overall production impacts on animals? And, um, and, and there's limited peer-reviewed literature uh, on this topic, but we do see, I can say that um, broadly speaking from my um, kind of uh, expert opinion perspective, working on uh, with herds that are positive um, and herds that have eradicated, I do believe that there are um, production losses. Now, if we look at the literature, 1988 paper, um, you know, showed that seropositive animals were more likely to be in the bottom quartile of production and have lower butter fat. Uh, similarly, in 1995, paper showed that multiparous positive and seropositive animals, so these were animals that were positive on the uh, antibody test, um, gave 195 pounds less milk and had a 21 day shorter lactation. Um, you know, when we look at our large commercial production systems, I'm not aware of anybody right now that has published a, you know, a kind of larger prospective type trial, but in situations where we do have CAE status and we can kind of monitor um, production, uh, now admittedly that may not be DHIA confirmed production or, uh, you know, the, of that kind of level of confidence, but where we can monitor those, I do believe that we see uh, generally, uh, you know, a, a production loss associated with um, CAE in these herds. How much is it? Is that 195 pounds accurate? Um, you know, as we've selected for these more insidious uh, virus, viral strains, 
I'm not sure. Um, and I think it could go either way. It could be more significant because we've selected for strains that maybe have a little bit more uh, propensity and tissue tropism for the mammary gland and, um, and impacting uh, that as opposed to the arthritic form um, or vice versa if we've selected for uh, you know a little bit attenuated viral strains then perhaps the production is less. But um, I am convinced on a personal level with um, you know, kind of my experience that there are production losses associated with CAE. And then because of that, it's important for us to consider. I also think that it, um, you know, it impacts and, and the approach that we are gonna talk about using to help control for CAE is uh, beneficial across the board with some other biosecurity changes. And so uh, implementing CAE prevention programs uh, broadly can be beneficial in a biosecurity form uh, or kind of biosecurity aspect um, and, and help to support the development of uh, healthy herds and healthy herd disease prevention programs, which can have a multitude of benefits beyond simply, um, you know, having, uh, having increased production. And so I am an advocate when we can for working to clean up herds. Now, having said that, that becomes a challenge, you know, in many of our commercial herds that I work on, you know, when we go in and we do seroprevalence in, in those herds, in many cases, you know, maybe 60, 70 percent of the herd is uh, seropositive. And so, um, again, knowing that once infected, always infected, um, you know, the kind of idea of coal, coal positive animals becomes very difficult if we're trying to um, produce milk and keep milk in the bulk tank and, and um, you know, keep that milk check flowing. And so, um, you know, we, we often have to look at a little bit more slow process and um, of uh, addressing CAE in those herds than a, than a rapid um, cull everybody that's positive. So our, our approach to managing the disease process in herds really needs to be an individual decision that's made between the producer and the veterinarian to uh, think about uh, what the opportunities are and how we can modify our management and, and structure to um, optimize cleaning the herd up over a period of time, as well as considering the financial implications of that and, and um, the labor implications of that. Um, but uh, recognize that in, in general, I do believe that there is some value in that. So this is a picture shared with me um, by Dr. Joni Rao. Um, and, and these are the types of uh, CAE cases I, I remember when I was a kid. And, and so you can see these um, significant uh, arthritic change in, in the knee here. Um, and, and these animals were, as I said, quite obvious. You, you could look at this animal and predict that it probably was CAE positive without ever taking a blood sample and, and running a diagnostic test. And, and so these pretty rapidly got um, culled. And, and in doing so, uh, you know, we, we kind of selected for viral strains that um, had a little bit less intense uh, manifestation in clinical signs and, and uh, are, I won't say necessarily attenuated. I'm not sure that they are attenuated. They, they may still cause as much or more production impacts, but they don't cause as, um, as nearly significant arthritic changes uh, we used to see. So when we're talking about herd level, as I said, I, I do think this disease process is important in herds. And so I advocate for uh, surveillance testing and monitoring in most of our herds. What this looks like varies a little bit depending on the size. So in my personal herd, small herd, um, pretty easy to bleed the herd. And, and at minimum, I think every and once a year, testing every animal in the herd, potentially twice a year, every six months, um, can be a fairly easy task to, um, to implement and, um, and have good outcomes. When we start moving into our larger herds that may be milking a thousand up to seven, eight thousand animals in an individual herd, that becomes a lot more challenging because just even at the, you know, at the cost of six dollars an animal and the, um, or seven dollars an animal, depending on where you're getting testing done, and um, the, the scope of having six or 7,000 animals to test, not only can the labor and effort and time for that sort of whole herd annual testing become 
uh, quite problematic, but it also can rapidly result in fairly significant costs. Um, you know, if I'm going to test 6,000 does, um, even if I'm getting a kind of a bulk discount, I may be looking at 30 to $36,000 worth of diagnostic testing for surveillance. So in these larger herds, we have to work with, um, or we recommend working with a veterinarian to determine kind of what level of surveillance is appropriate for the goals of the farm. Certainly if we're negative on the farm and, and we wanna maintain seronegativity, um, then we may be motivated in, in investing in um, a higher number of testing to, to make sure that if disease starts to spread, we identify that rapidly and um, can uh, address it uh, rapidly as well. Whereas uh, when we're perhaps looking at um, uh, starting to implement a program, we, we may spread uh, sampling out over pens or um, over years and, and start to clean up those in a little bit more progressive fashion to uh, or um, incremental fashion, if you will, to uh, to maintain uh, a, a, by a financial model that's um, effective in, in the herd as well as um, to manage the call or, or approach that we need to do. Certainly we can't call 60% of a herd and, and still maintain a milk tank full of milk and, and sending milk to the processor. So um, we have to consider that. But um, assuming that we're doing some form of uh, incremental annual or biannual testing of every um, animal in the herd or a subset of those animals, our goal is that all clinically affected or sear positive animals should be either culled or maintained in completely separate housing with no contact with negative animals. Now, this is always kind of the, the, the ideal situation, certainly what we advocate for. However, again, in, in our larger herds, this isn't always practical. And, and so here again, uh, herds and, and veterinarians need to work with their producers and, and the herd owners to determine how they can um, do that. In some cases, because of this propensity for a significant portion of our transmission to be vertical, um, you know, we may be willing to accept horizontal transmission risk between animals in a pen as we work to lower the prevalence of disease in a uh, herd. Um, now, certainly we could do that quicker if all clinically affected and seropositive animals were completely segregated. Um, but again, in many of our larger thousand plus doe operations, um, we may be able to put them in a separate pen, um, which decreases, you know, kind of direct contact, but we're not gonna probably build a new barn um, to, maintain those negative animals and then so we have to um, you know develop a plan that works for the system and the management practices that we have in place and the facilities that we have in place for sure if we're trying to move our or decrease zero prevalence we need to raise all of our kids um, from positive animals on a prevention program and we'll talk a little bit more here in a couple of slides about what our options are there. But uh, the take home message here is we need to have those kids um, making sure that they're not consuming um, viral positive colostrum and, um, and that they're uh, consuming biosecure colostrum from, from some source. Um, so because of that vertical transmission being the highest risk of disease transmission, um, all of our CAE surveillance systems and, and programs need to um, make sure to be addressing this uh, issue of colostral transfer of the virus. So when we think about testing, um, you know, there, there over the years hasn't been, I would say, a, a huge general consensus among vet veterinarians on, on the best testing platform, although I will say that I think that's um, now kind of uh, perhaps becoming more consensus, largely because some of the other tests um, have gone away. And so it used to be that the most commonly available tests were the agarose gel immunodiffusion or AGID test and the competitive ELISA, so competitive enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. Um, the AGID test was one of the first on the market, widely used early on. Uh, the C-ELISA was developed later. 
Um, both of those tests I used regularly. Um, now I will say on kind of the commercial breeding side, um, there was kind of a lot of belief that the C. Eliza was um, significantly better than the AGID test, but I, I'm not sure as a veterinarian that I really found that to be the case. Um, I used both of those tests fairly regularly, depending on the situation, and um, one in some cases was more appropriate than the other. So this kind of led to a lack of general consensus, although I would say that for some, like ADGA, American Dairy Goat Association sales and stuff, they required the competitive ELISA. Having said that, the AGID test has, has largely become unavailable through the manufacturers that were distributing that. And so the competitive ELISA is our primary test that's currently commercially available and, and consequently the one that the majority of diagnostic labs around the U.S. are using to uh, diagnose um, CAE. And, um, you know, a number of laboratories are providing this test. Um, my recommendation is not one particular laboratory over another, although I do recommend and see value in uh, AABLD accreditation. So the American Association of Veterinary Diagnostic Labs, AABLD, accredits uh, diagnostic labs in terms of their quality assurance, quality control testing, um, you know, check tests to make sure they're uh, developing and, and implementing these tests correctly, um, as well as doing, uh, you know, strong oversight of standard operating procedures. So not all diagnostic labs are AABLD accredited, um, but it is my assertion that AABLD accredited laboratories have benefit in C. ELISA testing because of the oversight and assurances that you get through quality control. They're making sure that um, you know the individuals running those tests are, are well trained on them. Um, you know that when when somebody's out of the laboratory for the uh, for the week on vacation, you don't have somebody new that's never run the test coming in and trying to figure out how to run the test. All of those types of areas. So um, while you can get the C. ELISA uh, tested or uh, perform that test at a number of diagnostic labs, I would advocate for looking for a diagnostic lab that is AABLD accredited. Um, you know, there's anecdotal problems reported with both tests. And, and um, you know, we hear these from producers all the time. I, I get calls from folks that say, oh, well, you know, this doe tested negative and then she tested positive and then we tested with this other test and she was negative and, um, and or, you know, this kid was, was negative and then all of a sudden the next year it's positive. And, and so they believe that there's, um, you know, a problem with the test. I think it's important to recognize that any diagnostic test, no, there's no diagnostic test that's 100% sensitive and 100% specific. Um, and so all of these tests, just like COVID testing that we're probably more familiar with these days, all these tests have the potential for false positives and false negatives. Luckily, that, that risk is low. And so, um, you know, that, that helps us to try and, um, and or to have more confidence in the test outcomes. But anytime we go to an individual animal, um, those uh, risk of potential false positives and false negatives kind of reoccur. And um, so in these cases, we sometimes have to do repeated testing um, and, and see what uh, might be going on there. And, and we cannot really consider any single test as, um, as the end all be all guarantee that an animal is either positive or negative. Largely, if they're positive, I, I think that's pretty significant. And particularly if they're in a herd that has a high rate of positives, um, you know, then we also need to assess this kind of at, a, at an animal or herd level basis. And so, um, you know, a herd level with a high prevalence of disease that I get a positive in, I feel pretty good about. Uh, if I've got a herd that has been negative for the last, um, you know, 10 years, whole herd negative for the last 10 years, and all of a sudden there's one or two positives, um, then, you know, that causes you to slow down. Certainly they could be real, but causes you to slow down and, and kind of say, hey, wait, I want, that's far out of what I was expecting. Um, this herd hasn't had any positives for a long time. If it's a closed herd, animals aren't being introduced. Let's dig into this a little bit more. 
So, um, you know, I certainly recommend working with your veterinarian to choose the best testing system. And um, certainly some of these laboratories will, will run these without veterinary involvement. But um, as a veterinarian myself, I, I would advocate that I think there's value in having your veterinarian involved in, in this because um, sometimes they have the ability to kind of interpret these um, unusual tests a little bit better. They may have confidence or strong working relationships with some of these diagnostic labs that can be beneficial in sorting out uh, disease or um, testing outcomes. And, um, and then they can provide more, more broad input too on, on how to manage uh, the virus in, in the population in your herd. So um, the competitive ELISA or CAE competitive ELISA, C ELISA is widely available. Um, and, and just a couple of comments here. So for instance, Australia has a CAE eradication program and they recommend avoiding testing animals for one month prior to or after kidding. Um, I'm not familiar with really robust, well-controlled clinical trials that suggest that this is necessary. But we do certainly recognize that during this period of time, periparturian period of time, uh, ahead of kidding and post kidding, the dam's immune response changes because, in in many senses, they have you know these dams have a um, a fetus, a parasite growing in their body. There is some degree of generalized immunomodulation and and immunosuppression that those does go through um, during this period of time. And um, certainly they're putting a lot of antibodies in their colostrum and in their milk um, during this period of time. And so, uh, you know, if we think about total antibody stores in the body and a bunch of those being put into the milk, um, that may decrease the total antibody or uh, viral load that is in the blood and, and consequently, um, you know, identify a period of time where they may be more likely to um, have a false negative as opposed to, um, you know, uh, a true positive. So uh, at least other countries have identified this as a high enough risk period to recommend um, avoiding. And, um, you know, in, in most of my herds where I'm going to do routine surveillance, uh, I actually recommend testing animals one and a half months or two months before kidding, so not at that one month period, but further forward um, before kidding, so that I can make sure and identify if I've got that high risk situation, um, even if I'm snatching kids off of those does after they're born, um, if I've got positive does, then my preference would not be to have that colostrum going even through heat treatment. I'd, I'd rather mitigate that risk of positive colostrum by tossing it entirely. Um, and, and so by testing a month and a half to two months prior to kidding, I can identify any positive animals and take measures, even if I'm going to keep those animals in the herd, at least till I get kids from them, to uh, move them out of um, out of the uh, colostrum and, and milk um, supply line. And, and so just because of that nature, I'm often doing the testing ahead of this. I'll also comment that the results can sometimes take some time to stabilize. And so this is some real data here at the bottom. It's a bit hard to um, you know, kind of read, but in essence, this is a group of um, goat kids that we experimentally infected with CAE virus. Um, so we know these kids were ex uh, exposed by spiking virus into their colostrum that they received a couple hours after birth. If we watch um, you know, the column here, uh, the first column is um, day zero. So that's their competitive ELISA average. Um, we, we ran two tests on each of these animals. So each kid, each um, time point. So um, day zero, day um, one week, two week, three week, four week, um, five week, um, out to day 115. So, um, uh, you know, a third of a year old. Um, we ran these tests on a regular basis and we ran each kid in duplicate and took the average. So not surprisingly, 
on um, day zero, um, you know, they had just received the virus inoculation. None of them were positive. None were positive on day seven. None were positive on day 14. So in an experimental infection model where we know these animals were exposed, at least for the first two weeks, um, we see no change on the competitive ELISA. Then at week three, we start to see some of these that are coming in. Now this lighter color um, is a animal that's kind of borderline. We, we typically consider um, animals, uh, you know, at 35% or 35 or above as positive, and then kind of a, um, a, a suspect range in there, 25 to 30 or something, depending on the testing lab and stuff. So these lighter colored examples are, are ones this top kid um, went to a suspect on day 21 and then became positive on day 28 and stayed positive throughout the um, remainder of the testing. However, um, an animal like this one, 14G004, um, that animal, even though we gave it significant concentrations of CAE, never became positive. So for whatever reason, that kid was able to ward off infection, even though they were challenged with the virus and never became positive. Um, I think what's interesting to look is it, um, some examples like this animal here, 14G10. Negative at day zero, negative at day, uh, week one, two, three. Suspect at week four and five, back to negative at week six, then back to suspect for a period of time for five weeks, and then back to negative, and then all the way to positive, and then back to suspect for three periods. Um, and, and you can see a, a similar type of animal up here. And so these types of real life situations do occur. And I think in many of these cases where, um, you know, we get a phone call and, and people are testing these kids and, um, you know, well, she was positive last week and now she's negative and, um, and then she became positive again. In many of those cases, I think it's real and it's the viral dynamics that are happening in there. She is positive when, you know, and um, um, so uh, if we have integration of virus in there, but know that these animals can waver around. Now, I know as a, as a producer and as a veterinarian, that's frustrating. Uh, you know, we wish they were all kind of like this animal here, or this animal up here. Um, where, you know, when they become positive, they stay positive and it just keeps going up and, and they never um, revert. But the fact of the matter is some of these animals kind of have an up and down, um, you know, kind of uh, approach. And, and so um, individual single point testing can be very problematic. If you happen to hit the week that they were negative, you think they're negative and in reality, the next week she's positive or, or vice versa. So, um, you know, I, I, this is just the frustration of, of, um, of these types of tests. Now, this chart is um, with animals that were experimentally infected and in spiked colostrum. So these are animals that um, received negative colostrum. So there was no antibodies from the mother because we specifically picked um, colostrum from negative dams and then we spiked virus into it. Um, on, in contrast, if you're using heat treated colostrum or raw colostrum, you could have a dam that um, you know, has antibodies that the dam has developed that she is now putting into the colostrum. And so if we heat treat that colostrum, we destroy the virus. But if we're heat treating appropriately, we don't negatively impact those antibodies. And now the kid receives those antibodies. And so for the first couple of weeks, they could potentially be positive on testing while not clinically infected. So they're, the antibody levels from the, uh, from the dam that was passed through that colostrum that was heat treated prevented the viral transmission, but allowed for uh, the heat treated colostrum to have those antibodies. So they become positive on test. And then as those maternal or mom's antibodies start to wane over time, 
then because they're not infected, now mom's antibodies wane, they're not infected, they don't continue to develop their own antibodies and they become seronegative. So, um, you know, the kind of take home here is that before three or four weeks, it's really hard to call an animal that has a known exposure to CAE negative because it typically takes them three or four weeks with a, a pretty sizable load of virus that's inoculated in, in lower viral amounts, it might even take longer to become seropositive and vice versa if they've consumed colostrum and they have an antibody but not virus, they can be seropositive for a period of time and take anywhere up to two to three months for those to go negative. So testing really young animals is, is kind of problematic and um, I would caution against over-interpreting the results of any of these tests very, very early on. I also do wanna comment that there are some other tests um, available for CAE. One of those is the polymerase chain reaction or the PCR test. Um, in this case, we're not looking for antibodies to CAE, but we're actually looking for the actual um, material. I say DNA here, it's, um, it's actually, this is an RNA virus, but we're doing PCR. We have to convert the RNA to DNA. So we're, we're doing the test on DNA um, that's converted from the RNA. So we're looking for this DNA material in white blood cells. Um, it, it's more expensive and it's less widely available. Um, so this isn't generally my first choice for screening animals. Uh, it probably has more um, false negatives and false positives than the competitive ELISA, uh, depending on the sample type and how the sample was collected. But if we do get a positive sample or if we have an animal that competitive ELISA has really given us some problems, these are the type of situations where we might come back in and, and use a PCR to see if we can detect the viral um, genomic material itself. And so it, it is available, but not commonly used as a screening test. So now that we've talked a little bit about testing, um, I just want to touch on uh, prevention. And so again, uh, the focus of our prevention revolves around the colostrum and kidney management. Once a herd is negative, um, you know, we need to prevent introduction of a positive animal or colostrum blood or any sort of bio secure, um, non-biosecure material from that animal into the herd. So um, particularly if we're processing our colostrum or if any of these kids have the potential to be nursing off of dams, um, you know, only a, a single positive animal coming in can have a significant impact. And I have clinically seen where we might have a herd of 30 negative does, um, you know, they, because they've been negative for a period of time, um, the biosecurity gets a little bit lax and, and maybe they um, back off of uh, heat treating colostrum or, or something like that. You get one positive animal in and the milk or colostrum from that animal is commingled and then fed to a large number of animals and you can quite rapidly have a significant increase in seroprevalence within the herd. So um, when we've invested the time and energy into getting, taking a herd negative, uh, we certainly want to increase our biosecurity, prevent induction of po uh, introduction of positive animals, aggressively test multiple times um, new herd introductions, and quarantine them in, until we are sure and feel confident of their um, testing, uh, testing level. We also can see benefit in evaluating the herd of origin for evidence of either clinical signs or positive tests. So if I'm going to buy an animal and move it into a herd in which I've um, gone negative and I have a strong basis for feeling that, um, that our, this herd is, is negative, um, my preference would be to buy animals from herds that also are negative. Um, because if I buy a test negative animal from a herd that I know is positive, um, then that sort of increases my risk of, of potentially having a breakthrough case there. So um, when making these buying decisions and, and uh, introduction decisions, not only is the individual animal testing sometimes helpful, but also looking more broadly at the, um, at the herd of origin for evidence of uh, clinical signs and, um, and positive tests. And, and the same principle holds true, whether it's talking about um, Cassius lymphadenitis or Yoni's disease or any of these other disease processes. Um, not only is individual animal testing valuable, but, but also kind of herd level or, 
um, source testing um, is always valuable. And as always, we recommend isolating new animals for several weeks and, and reevaluating, retesting prior to introduction. When I think about CAE prevention, I really, you know, think about this more broadly with my clients as, and as I think a number of other vets do is, is kind of chronic disease prevention. So these same mechanisms of control that we're going to talk about really not only help in controlling CAE, but they also help in controlling prevalence and outbreaks of Yoni's disease, Cassius lymphadenitis, mycoplasma, as well as CAE. And so I think um, veterinarians working with herd owners to think about implementation of a CAU prevention program and or um, herd owners that are trying to decide if um, progressing with a testing strategy and, and somehow trying to clean their herd up is worthwhile should consider this from the broader perspective. So, you know, when we talk about improved productivity and we talked about those numbers with CAE, there may actually be other unrealized um, produce, improved productivity that's not CAE specific, but occurs from a decreased um, prevalence of mycoplasma or Cassius lymphadenitis or Yoni's disease. So um, the, the control methodology, the biosecurity aids in all of these disease processes. And, and so it really gives us a, a higher return on investment as we consider these implementation strategies as opposed to um, just focusing on CAE. So heat treatment of colostrum has for a long time been the mainstay of, um, of CAE prevention. The, uh, this is the system that um, many of us use in the purebred, uh, you know, kind of uh, breeding stock arena. Um, and, and so in this scenario, um, the kids are snatched from the mom, uh, from the dam before they have an opportunity to nurse. And then the colostrum is going to be collected and the colostrum is heat treated. Now, this is different than pasteurization. Um, pasteurization is a higher temperature, shorter duration, but that high temperature uh, inactivates or um, kills, if you will, the antibodies, um, denatures the antibodies. And so um, that leads to the kids not having adequate immunity from their dam, um, but also with this colostrum because of the high protein and high solids, if you try and pasteurize it at a pasteurizer temperature, it actually will turn to almost scrambled egg consistency. And so when we talk about heat treatment, this is a lower temperature, longer period of time of treatment, typically 56 Celsius for an hour, um, that at that temperature controls the virus. Um, but also minimizes the impact on the antibodies. Um, and so that allows us to give the, to the kids, um, they continue to receive adequate antibodies, um, but at, without the virus. The obvious complication here is that, um, you know, collecting all that colostrum and heat treating it for an hour and controlling that temperature adequately to make sure that it doesn't wander up to you know, more than four or five degrees to where it potentially would, um, would denature those antibodies or it doesn't wander down to where we're not inactivating the virus can be quite difficult. And uh, on an individual animal basis, you know, certainly that's a, a challenge, but when you start trying to scale that up to um, hundreds or thousands of those kidding at one time, that can be quite challenging. Now, there are um, systems that are commercially available, for instance, a, a product called Dairy Tech, and, and there's some others as well that are essentially water baths, hot water baths that are controlled by a computer. And so you can go in, you package the colostrum, you place it in the water bath, you hit the go button, and it does all of that for you. But these systems tend to cost um, thousands of dollars, and, and so most of our smaller scale uh, farms don't have the wherewithal financially to um, install those. And, and so instead they're trying to do CAE prevention on a budget and, and you know, do that on the stove or um, some other mechanism. That can be really challenging to hold that temperature for a long period of time. And so I am a big advocate of what I call um, hobos or these kind of digital temperature loggers. Um, you can buy them online for $25 to $30, and, and they look like little, um, honestly, they look almost like a little watch battery, 
um, and, and they are wireless and you can put them in a liquid. They're designed for monitoring. Obviously you have to buy one that's designed for submersion in a liquid, but, um, or you can put them in food sources. You can put them anywhere and, and they will um, digitally record the temperature down to the 10th of the degree at preset time points. And so, you know, if you, if you set those um, using the computer to record them every minute or every five minutes, um, then these make a really nice tool to, to throw in your water bath or if you're um, doing this on the stove or, um, you know, in th those different areas um, to throw it in, leave it in there for an hour, pull it out at the end and then plot that on your computer um, with an automatic download from those digital temperature recorders and you can actually see what temperature you're getting. And, and so, for instance, um, you know, uh, if you look at heat treatment using um, crock pots, which does not work well. Um, crock pots don't have, you know, a temperature gauge. They have low, medium, high, um, and, and that's, they have a wide margin of uh, allowable temperatures. And so if you turn them on the low, you, you see this very um, significant um, 20 to 30 degree kind of sawtooth edge increase and decrease in, in uh, temperature over the period of the hour. And, and if those temperatures rise too high, you can almost be guaranteed that you're inactivating the antibodies and, and vice versa if they're too low that you're not killing the virus. So these relatively cheap data loggers can be very helpful even for small herds. Um, again, affordable, $25, $30 to, to toss in there and watch over an hour and see how your temperature is doing. Um, but again, crock pots aren't a good option um, for smaller herds. Sometimes they'll just use a thermometer and, and keep it on the stove or in a kind of a double boiler. Um, you can also, uh, in some cases, you can buy, uh, you know, kind of automated pasteurization units that can also be turned down to a, a lower temperature and, and held for a longer time. And so in that case, the computer on that system is monitoring it and adjusting temperature or in its most um, kind of simplistic form, sometimes this is a really high quality thermos that you can warm up to the appropriate temperature, pour your colostrum in, seal that thermos down. And if it's a high quality thermos that holds temperature, leave it there for an hour and the total temperature might only go down a, temp a degree or two. Um, but again, those low cost data loggers allow you to throw that in there, monitor it and, and really have a good idea of how you're doing on your uh, colostrum heat treatment process. So I'm a, a big um, advocate for those. The other option is, um, so, you know, we would consider heat tree colostrum to be kids safe for, for CAE prevention. We could consider using bovine colostrum, but we run the risk of inducing or bringing in other biosecurity concerns, mycoplasmas, yonis disease. Um, so we could heat treat that colostrum as well. Um, but then we're getting bovine antibody in, instead of um, goat antibody. So, um, you know, it, it has its downsides. And then we certainly could also consider a commercial colostrum replacer. And, and quite honestly, in many of our larger um, commercial herds, this is the route that folks are going. Now, it's important to recognize that there are no goat specific antibody colostrum, commercial colostrum replacers. So even though there might be a picture of a goat on the package, uh, all of these are providing bovine immunoglobulin or bovine antibodies. Um, in the grand scheme of things, that's probably not the world's worst thing. Um, but it is important because that same level of antibody um, if you had the exact same level of goat antibody compared to cow antibody in a goat, the goat antibody at that level will provide more protection than the cow will um, because of what we call the FC receptors and um, the, the portion of the antibody that's involved in, in medi mediating some of the immune responses. If we have bovine antibody, the goat um, the goat's body can't use that antibody to the exact same degree that it could a goat uh, antibody. However, you know, this is a colostrum replacer, so it's powered. 
powdered, it's easy to um, you know, mix back up. You don't have to spend an hour heat treating it. We don't have risk of CAE transmission because cows don't get CAE. Um, and, and so in large commercial systems, this often is, a, is an approach that can be used. And um, certainly from a veterinary perspective, we kind of have to optimize intake rates and, and make sure that we're not getting neonatal diarrhea because of lower um, antibody levels. The, the fact of the matter is that um, even though most of these commercial colostrum replacers are, are labeled to be used at a particular dose, that dose won't give us the same level of protection that, um, that consumption of the same volume of, of for instance, heat tree go colostrum would. And so um, we may have to play with dosing levels and, and increase those some. Um, but without a doubt, this, uh, this approach is increasing in its prevalence. Now, those colostrum replacers are expensive, and, and to some degree, you get what you pay for. So quality, um, you don't want to go with the lowest quality product out there that just because it's cheaper. Um, but that expense is offset by a significant decrease in labor expense of having to collect and, and um, heat treat for an hour every batch of colostrum in the process. So we're going to rear our kids separate from, from them and other possibly positive animals. Um, we also can't just stop with the colostrum, so we have to feed safe milk sources. And, and so those are either pasteurized goat's milk, pasteurized cow's milk, or milk replacer. Most commonly in our commercial operations, it's going to be a milk replacer. And it's important to remember that just one single mistake with the milk can infect the entire kid crop. So, um, you know, as you're making that up, if you're using pasteurized goat milk, um, you've got to have a system in place and a standard operating procedure to make sure that every batch is pasteurized appropriately and has good quality control. Because if one of those um, you know, the, the, the kids um, say they pasteurized it and um, they accidentally forgot to do it or, or the electricity went out while it was in the pasteurizer and it never reached temperature. Um, you know, then you feed that to a whole group of kids through a lamb bar or something like that. Uh, then that can lead to a significant um, risk. So whenever we're bulk feeding kids in mass, uh, you know, having a positive and unsafe milk source go into that bucket can have a significant impact on future prevalence. And then finally, I just want to comment on, on kids and failure of passive transfer or FPT. So, you know, when we're artificially rearing these kids, meaning that we've, we've taken them off of mom because we're going to prevent transmission of um, CAE from, from mom to the baby, it now becomes um, kind of important on our role, our um, role as, as uh, herd owners or veterinarians to assure that those kids get adequate antibodies from whatever we're using. So we have to appropriately handle the colostrum and milk. Um, and just because it's pasteurized doesn't mean that there's low bacterial counts. We can pasteurize or heat treat colostrum and still have quite high bacterial counts. So we have to take care of it, keep it refrigerated, warm it up and, and provide it to them as a meal. And we need to assure that they consume sufficient colostrum within the first 18 ideally hours or certainly within 24 hours. And so um, many of the disease outbreaks that we see, for instance, with neonatal diarrhea or, or other disease outbreaks, and our commercial herds are often associated with a failure in this process. And so, um, you know, we've, we've been talking about CAE prevention programs here and the importance of that, but it's equally important to recognize that a prevention program that looks good on paper, but falls short of achieving good antibody levels or good bacterial control in the milk or the um, colostrum can have equally significant negative outcomes on diarrhea and an increased risk of failure of passive transfer. So um, as I'm talking to veterinary students, there's no one size fits all on this situation. You can have farms that are doing everything perfect on paper, but in the process, something um, falls through and have a massive outbreak of, of kid diarrhea that potentially has an even bigger impact uh, than the CAE would have. So um, just becomes incumbent on us as we transition from that, um, from that mom rearing the kid to, to us taking that on 
to really do be proactive and, and make sure that we're assuring that those kids get adequate antibodies. So with that, we've, we've visited uh, about what CAE is. We've recognized that uh, you know, over the past couple of decades, the severity of CAE seems to be um, you know, decreasing some. That doesn't mean that it's causing less production losses, but um, it's just less obvious to look at an animal and identify who's infected and who's not. So testing is important. And their competitive ELISA is our, our mainstay of testing. Um, in herds where we're trying to monitor prevalence and seroprevalence and either keep them negative or, or um, mitigate risk, we like to test annually or, or twice a year using the competitive ELISA. And then we have opportunities to um, clean herds that are positive up. And um, key components of that are um, addressing that uh, transfer for, through colostrum from mom to the baby, um, addressing transfer from animal to animal horizontal uh, transfer within pins, less of a risk than colostrum, uh, colostrum transmission, but definitely does still occur. Um, and, and then thinking about how we're going to control this in the kids, whether that's use of colostrum replacer, which kind of um, as long as those kids are completely segregated and they never nursed off of mom um, is our, our most significant um, ability to, to break that cycle um, with the potential downside that we're not getting goat antibody or using a heat treated colostrum and pasteurized milk approach um, that allows us to control the viral transmission between those animals. But continual management and monitoring of that is critical again, one lapse in that can have a significant impact in, in recognizing that as we work to clean up herds, it takes some time. And, and so particularly in herds where we can't do an aggressive call strategy, it might take several years to take an, uh, a herd from a pretty high zero prevalence down to um, a much more uh, manageable or, or completely negative status. But it's worthwhile and we're controlling not only CAE, but all of these other disease processes as well. So I hope this information has been helpful and useful for you as you think about CAE control in your dairy goat herd. Um, I think um, Jen Bentley is gonna be willing to answer some questions now um, live. And uh, again, my apologies for not being there live, um, but certainly happy to answer questions by email, um, pplummer, P-P-L-U-M-M-E-R, at iastate.edu. Um, and so appreciate you joining the webinar today. Excited about the research that we're doing here at Iowa State with collaborators around the country um, looking to address these dairy goat disease processes and, um, and hope that some of this information that we've shared uh, can be readily implemented in your herd to continue to improve the health and well-being of, of your dairy goats. Have a great day.